<laughs> yeah, I, I know about that. So I'll start. Um, I'm Miller Piggott. Uh, with, I'm the director of Alzheimer's of Central Alabama, and I'm joined on the screen by um, Katie Cochran, who is with Home Instead, and um, Dr. Daniel Potts. And I am so pleased that we're having these webinars and that they're being well received. This is the first one we've ever done in the evening. So um, everything we're doing right now is, an, is a little bit of an experiment. I want to um, be sure that you're aware of upcoming programs that we've got. We, um, next week is with Christy Baines, who is also an excellent speaker. Christy knows a lot about um, placement issues, uh, family issues, family matters, and her webinar will be on July 9th. And the following week, um, we're really pleased to announce that we'll have Dr. David Gelmacher doing a uh, research update for us. And we try to have Dr. Gelmacher um, do that for us once a year, and I'm really pleased that he will be able to join us um, as well. One other thing I want to be sure to let y'all know, since we've got so many folks on here from so many uh, diverse backgrounds, is that Alzheimer's of Central Alabama can offer um, an emergency supply of continent supplies for two months um, to any caregiver that needs those. So if that's a need that you have, please reach out to us. Um, you can find a really quick, easy um, one-page application on our website and um, that might provide some relief to families that you know, know that are struggling right now. I am going to um, toss this over to Katie, who has got some housekeeping information about um, CEUs. And I'm going to share my screen. And if I keep putting these on and off, I'm new to reading glasses and I can't, I'm not, I don't know how, how this distance thing is, is freaking me out. So just a few things as far as those people who need CEUs. Um, I love how y'all can see everything that's pulled up. You gotta be real careful about that. Um, the survey is going to be through SurveyMonkey. So after this um, presentation, the people who have attended are going to, I can't remember if you're gonna get an email or it's going to send you, it's the first time we've ever done the survey through Zoom. Um, so you will get a link for the survey. Only people who need to see you need to fill out that survey. The others, you can fill it out just so we can have feedback, but it's not, uh, it's not mandatory. On the survey, it's going to ask you for your license number. So we will uh, have that on record and be able to submit to the Board of Nursing and the Board of Social Work. And um, if you're on the phone, participating in this, then please email Sherry at, it's right there, ACA2 at ALZCA.org and let us know that that is you on the line because when we run a report, all it shows is a phone number. So um, I think that is about it. Can y'all think of anything else, Miller? No, but again, I really want to thank Katie for her help with this and, and Home Instead for their continued sponsorship and support of Alzheimer's of Central Alabama. They have um, been with us for many, many years, and we really appreciate everything that, that they do for us. And now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Danny Potts. He is a Tuscaloosa neurologist with the VA, but you know what Danny does professionally and then almost sort of is a hobby, but not really is a hobby, is just amazing. He is a photographer. Um, he is a writer of poetry. He is an inspiration to everybody who knows him. And we are so fortunate today that he is um, going to share his story um, of his dad and um, Lester Potts, who you are going to feel like you know um, when, when this presentation is over with. And um, Danny, I'm going to let you take it from there. And again, thank you so much for sharing your, your insights and, um, and your wisdom. And also for helping us see that beautiful things can come from this Alzheimer's journey. Miller, thank you so much. Um, you just gave the punchline right there. And, and that's, what, that's what this story is really about. So it's an honor to be, um, to be with you all today. I appreciate Miller asking me. 
appreciate Katie's support. And I just, I'm always thankful for the opportunity to tell people this story. Some of you on, on the, the uh, webinar today may have heard this story before in some form, parts of the story, uh, some variation or iteration of it. But as I tell people all the time, it changes from day to day because I learn new things and um, I ponder um, what has happened to us and the lessons we've learned and the story grows. So if you've heard it before, it may be different this time. So um, with, with that said, I would like to try and share my screen with you so that you can see PowerPoint, and I hope everybody can see that. Um, in a nutshell, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to um, tell you a little bit about my dad, Lester, a little bit about his Alzheimer's disease and what happened to him during the disease what happened to us during that time and after that time, and how we've had an opportunity to ponder over it and try to glean any lessons that we can uh, from, from that whole experience. So I've had 14 years since Dad's, since Dad's passing to really think about it, to research what happened, to learn, um, a lot about um, the phenomenon of artistic creativity, but not only that, to sort of ponder th the philosophy of it and to learn from many, many smart people uh, and people who have walked this journey also. And many of those are people living with dementia. So I learn all the time from people living with dementia. So what I'm gonna share with you today is our story, but it's really the story of so many others, too many to name, and what they have taught me as a neurologist. So um, Lester's legacy, lessons learned. That is my, my dad, Lester, that you see there in that photo. Um, for some reason, that's, there we go, it's advancing now. So my objectives today are really to first of all, frame this talk a little bit and talk about stigma, talk about what I think is the cause of that stigma and to counter that with the concept of personhood, which my dad showed me is still present in those who have dementia. Talk a little bit about the expressive arts and creativity, how they affected dad and how they've affected others. Talk about how we were changed by dad's story and then reflect a bit on what we've learned from dad and others living with dementia and their care partners. And um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of dad's art too as we go along. I do have to disclose that I have done some gratis work for Embodied Labs, which is a virtual reality company that has made some modules um, that um, teach people about what it may be like to live with dementia. And also my family and I have formed a foundation called Cognitive Dynamics, which I'll speak more about. My wife, Ellen, is very much my partner and we both have been touched by dementia in the future and the family and many family members. And we wrote a book called A Pocket Guide to the Alzheimer's Caregiver a few years back to talk about our experiences. I found out a minute ago, if I move very much, uh, the audio goes out. So if I look like I have a stiff neck, then um, <laughs> I've, 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 I've not been accused of being stiff necked, but anyway, I may have a prick in my neck, but there's a reason, a reason for that. Let's talk about stigma, which we all are familiar with definition that Webster's gives is the disapproval of or discrimination against a person based on perceivable characteristics that serve to distinguish that person from other members of society. And certainly we see this running rampant in our day and time. Um, but we're going to talk specifically today about stigma associated with dementia. What's the root cause of that? Well, I've had an opportunity to think a lot about it, as you may as of as well. And I think the root cause of it is that we don't believe that persons living with dementia are really fully persons. So I think that um, we may think that they embody less personhood or less self than the, than, than the rest of us, that, that dementia somehow renders somebody less a person, uh, as if anything at all could do that. I remember looking at some of my dad's artwork at a time when I thought that about my dad. And he countered my thinking with his beautiful art. And 
I remember pondering a, a painting that we'll look at later called the blue collage and thinking a man in late stage Alzheimer's disease just basically painted his life story at a time when I thought he was fading out. So I think more than anything else, dad's art and just resilient spirit has shown me that the person lives on. There are a lot of ways we can define personhood and, and I certainly am not a philosopher, a theologian, a lawyer, a medical ethicist, etc. But I've thought a lot about it, so I'm going to offer a two cents worth uh, simple country neurologist from Pickens County's definition of personhood. And I think it's, it's the, the condition of being a person, it being a relational being who's made in the image of God, who is named by God, and, and who will be eternally remembered and sustained through that love and who's been given the potential to grow more in the likeness of God through the capacity for love, compassion, and relationships. So as you can see, my definition of personhood is very much a, um, a spiritual definition. Um, and, and as I've walked this journey with, with Dad and others, I see this journey as really a journey of spiritual growth. Um, in this definition, you'll see that I believe person, personhood is imparted. It can't be gained or lost. It's not earned. It is inherently sacred and dignified. It isn't dependent on productivity, morals, or cognitive ability. That's very important. It's not dependent, I don't believe, on cognitive ability. You see, I am because I was created, named. God sees me, knows me, sustains me, and remembers me. And so when a person fades out, they are remembered and they are still a person. Well, I think this has profound implications for the way that all of us uh, interact with persons living with dementia and, and regard them. I think it should call forth our finest and most compassionate traits as care partners. And it really means that we never give up on them no matter how far the progression, severe the disease, or challenging the behavior, that we not give up on their personhood, because I don't think there are any human shells. There's content there. So are people living with dementia aware that they are still there? Do they have an intact sense of self? A lot of research has been done on this, and it turns out that, that in some senses the sense of self probably is fractured and actually it is shored up by relationships. So the importance of the relationships that someone has when they're living with dementia can't be overemphasized. Uh, but research does suggest that personal identity persists in some form, even into late stage Alzheimer's. Um, due to declining cognition, a person with dementia may need those of us who are in relationships with them to sort of hold their story, to respond to them as a thou, a unique person. And we'll talk about that terminology in a second. And I base these ideas off, on some, off of some of the research of Kitwood and Fazio and others that we'll talk about in a minute. You know, if you talk to people living with Alzheimer's and other dementias, you'll, you'll, you'll hear some of this. We have this friend, Brian LeBlanc, who has spoken for ACA and, and is just such a, a wonderful advocate for people living with Alzheimer's. He himself has early onset Alzheimer's. And Brian says, I'm still me. I know the face my family and I see in the mirror. I, I have no choice but to accept that, that face. I think that's why the one thing I do know is how much I love them and how much they love me. And he says, I appreciate the friends that haven't deserted me with hopes that they never go away because I have Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's doesn't have me. I think for us here, he's lifting his banner up, just like Glenn Campbell did. Uh, many of you know Glenn Campbell was affected by Alzheimer's, and his family took him on a tour, a 152-date tour, right at the end of his life, while he could still perform. And backstage, you may not know where he was, but once he got on stage, he played that guitar and he sang those songs. He, in effect, was raising his banner high, saying, I'm still here. My name's Glenn Campbell, and I can play guitar. Sometimes it's hard for us to see personhood. Sometimes it's hard for us to tap into that personhood. 
some, some ways to do it are through authentic and compassionate relationships. Um, and many people have written about that. I think faith and spirituality is a way to do it. Creativity and expressive arts, as we'll talk about, especially music. You've seen people light up with pets in the presence of pets and, and, and other animals and in the presence of young children. These are ways to tap in. Nature taps deeply, imagination and play, reminiscence, humor, a belly laugh with your loved one sort of can bring them out, put everybody on the same level. Centering in the present moment, giving back to others, giving them opportunities to be generative, to give back to other people, to, to know that they're helping others. Um, and there's some innovative ways to do that. And then living in ways that add meaning and purpose. These help us tap into not only personhood of people living with dementia, but our own personhood. Something that I came to see firsthand because I was, I was this way with my dad is a quote that is spoken about, a concept that's spoken about by Madeline Langle, the children's author that, that you, you may know. Because you're not what I would have you be, I blind myself to who in truth you are. I didn't want dad to be descending into dementia. I wanted him to be the dad that I remember. I wanted to be able to interact with him the way that, that we used to. But he was not able to do that. As he hey, Danny? Drifted in. Do I, yes. I'm interrupting. I'm sorry. I okay. think you need to go super stiff neck again. I need to go stiff neck? I'm sorry. Okay. Super stiff neck. It's going in and out a little bit. It's going in and out. Okay. I'm sorry. Can y'all hear? That's okay. Yep. All right. Please chime, chime in if it, if it happens again. Okay. So I was holding dad to be responsible to be something that he couldn't be anymore. And that was who my mind wanted him to be. And instead of meeting dad in the present moment, I was digging in my heels, so to speak, and wishing him back. And I'll have to confess to you that during the time dad was with us, I didn't fully appreciate that concept. And it's only been more recently that I have. But I tell people all the time now, this is a quote to really think about and ponder. I think people have elements of their personhood that continue to exist. And I call these elements pillars of personhood. And they are innate characteristics and traits that someone had that has had all their life that still remain. For instance, I had a friend who was a voice professor who got Alzheimer's and in many ways he was changing, but he had the characteristic of being a teacher. And when he was allowed to teach voice, he became himself again. So I think if we can learn how to tap into these strengths, these characteristics, then we're more likely to be able to see that person come out. And as Brendan Bouchard says so beautifully, if we help others focus on their strengths more than their limitations, we discover what's been missing themselves. So this is certainly one of the things that we, that we talk about. We know that person-centered care is the gold standard. It's respectful of the values and the dignity of an individual so that they can make choices, self-determination with purpose. And we know that dementia care environments um, can do things that honor that personhood. Dr. Sam Fazio with the Alzheimer's Association and other organizations has noted that knowing the person living with dementia, recognizing and accepting that person's reality, identifying and supporting ongoing opportunities for meaningful engagement, and building and nurturing authentic caring relationships in a supportive community, all are consistent with person-centered care for people that have dementia. And I'm saying all this because these are things that we learn because of dad. This is what I consider Lester's legacy. All of this that I'm covering in the first part of the talk, because I never would have known this had it not been for dad. Another person that 
has been so profound in, in our care models is Naomi File, who founded Validation Therapy um, and who herself is caring for her husband who has Alzheimer's now. Some of her principles are that all people are unique and valuable and have to be accepted non-judgmentally, even if they're disoriented, that there's a reason behind behaviors which may reflect a combination of brain chemistry, physical and social and psychological changes that take place over a lifetime. When recent memory fails, people will try to restore balance by retrieving earlier memories. When painful feelings are expressed, acknowledged and validated, we can lessen some of the behaviors that we see. And she certainly preaches empathy because empathy builds trust, reduces anxiety, and helps to restore dignity. Thomas Kitwood, who I mentioned a minute ago, was a British researcher and who noted that as a person's sense of self may be fractured by Alzheimer's, it's the quality of the relationship that builds that sense of self back up. And so what we see with dementia is not only changes caused by brain pathology, but also changes caused by the way we treat people. So supportive environments are very, very important. And lastly, I, in this first part of the talk, I want to cover a couple of philosophers that um, I've read a lot of during this time since my dad has passed on, one of which is Martin Buber, who talks about the I-thou relationship. And I want to frame this by saying that Martin Buber's I-thou relationship is the relationship that I think we need to have with people living with dementia. You know, we have two ways of engaging the world, I it and I thou. An I it relationship is based on experience and not real relationship. There's a distance there. We don't really tap deeply to regard somebody as a holistic person. It's subject to object. But in the I-thou relationship, which is really what he calls an encounter, I and you are transformed. We regard each other as persons, holistically, and we come away changed. And he argues that once we have an encounter like this, which is really characterized by love, we begin to see the world differently. And he says, in every true thou we encounter, we encounter the eternal. And I believe that's what has happened in so many of us who have been touched by encounters with people living with dementia. Very deep relational experiences with them. It may be at the end of their lives in hospice. It may be when they first been diagnosed. But if we allow ourselves to really tap deeply into that personhood, we transform. And this is what happened in my dad's case. Along those same lines, another philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, talked about the power of the human face to change us. Being touched by the vulnerable and injured face of another causes us to not be able to be indifferent anymore. We feel responsible. We feel empathy. I love the quote by Simone Campbell, who says, touching that which causes us to weep can liberate the transforming fire of hope within us. We don't like to touch it. We don't like to be next to the suffering. But when we allow ourselves to be in that space, it changes us. Maya Angelou said, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. And many of our loved ones living with dementia have untold stories. And Brene Brown says, owning that story, and loving ourselves through the process is the bravest thing we will ever do. Did you know that a lot of people with dementia don't know they have it? They're not told. They're not walked through it. They're not allowed to come to grips with that information. And I think it's important that we 
share it with them compassionately so that they can live in spite of it, live well in spite of it. So with that as a background, I'm gonna finish up the talk and tell you a little bit about Lester Eugene Potts, who was born November the 4th, 1928, and passed away September the 15th, 2007. That's dad, and he's quite simply the best guy I've ever known. I still say that, and I've known a lot of good ones. That's our family. You can see me there in polyester in the late 1960s, and you can see my daughters and wife with some of dad's artwork along with my mom. And this is, uh, these are the folks that were in dad's inner circle. But also in dad's inner circle were the fine folks at Caring Days Adult Daycare here in Tuscaloosa, the Mal and Charlotte Moore Center, where dad was able to attend for about four years. An ACA sponsored organization that has changed all of our lives. And the folks at Caring Days showed Lester that he was worth something the way he was. The Lester that came through the front door every day at Caring Days was the one that they met, they validated, they loved, and that they enabled to be himself. I can't say enough good things about Caring Days, and I may break up when I'm trying to talk about Caring Days because it's meant so much to me, to my family, and to so many people. Bless their hearts right now, it's a tough time for all of us in COVID-19 and this pandemic because there's so many people that need help and they want to give it and they're working out ways to do it. So I'm thankful that they are being innovative and, and, um, and we can talk more about that. But Caring Days is where dad discovered his art. And actually the, the gentleman that you saw in the middle picture back there was George Parker. He was an artist that volunteered uh, at Caring Days. He was not an art therapist, but George knew how to share his, his talent and he showed Lester that he could paint. And so dad painted over a hundred watercolors while working with George, many of which we still have, or we have the digital version of. And over the next four years of dad painting these watercolors, his life story came out and he was validated and it gave him something to live for. So I want to walk you through a three or four of dad's paintings and show you that elements of dad's life story came out in the art. My dad was a sawmiller growing up in rural Pickens County. He had been around many, many a log that he'd sawed on in, uh, many, a, many a tree, and he built stuff with wood, like that little birdhouse that you see in the center of that slide. Dad was himself an oak of a man. When dad was uh, painting with George, uh, I want you to see that he was able to um, recall some of those images from childhood and paint interlocking wood rings in that painting at the top right. You see a duck at the bottom right that also has wood rings. Many of dad's later works had rings of wood. You also can see that he loved trees. He painted trees all the time because he was around those in the sawmill. In the upper left-hand corner, you see dad with some of his birdhouses that he made for the community before he got Alzheimer's. And you can see in these paintings that dad continued to paint birdhouses. A birdhouse motif showed up in some of dad's later artwork, as you can see with the red circles. And it seemed to give him peace and give him comfort to do that. In the next slide, uh, you can see fences. Dad loved fences. He loved to build fences. Um, he was a man of boundaries himself. There's a 1936 photo in the top left of dad and his family uh, with a fence. And you can see some other fences here. He loved to paint fences. This particular story, mini story here, has been quite important to our family, especially in the current day in which we live with racial tens tensions and um, the racism that, we, that we're hopefully finally beginning to come to grips with. One of dad's best friends and one of his co-workers in the sawmill coming along was this gentleman, Mr. Albert Porter from Pickett's County. When I was six years old, dad took me to see Mr. Albert for the first time. 
And I saw those two interact like brothers, hugging each other, loving each other, kidding with each other. And it made a lasting impression on me that I hope to never forget. When my dad was late in life, later in life, he told me one time, he said, son, if anything happens to me or to the family, I want you to contact, find, get in touch with Albert because Albert will help us. Dad felt the same way about him. When Dad was at the end of his life. He painted Albert and Lester pulling the crosscut saw like they had done so many years ago. And he didn't, couldn't tell us who this was. But when I asked him who it was, he put his hand on Mr. Albert and cried. He knew exactly who it was. And this has shown me that relationships persist. Loving relationships continue to be powerfully at work in the mind and heart and soul of somebody living with dementia. So please don't forget that. The relationships are important. This is dad's dad. I called him Big Daddy, Lester Potts Sr. in the 1920s all the way up to the 1940s. And when I knew him as a little boy, he always had high top brogans. You see those lace up shoes that Big Daddy wore. He always wore a hat also, kind of like Bear Bryant, always had a hat on. Dad, Big Daddy had a hat on. And he was recognized uh, as one who did that. He also loved to build with wood and he pulled a crosscut saw with my dad. At the end of dad's life, Dad painted this painting. We call it the Blue Collage. This is Dad's most well-known work. And the reason it is is because of the things it tells us about late-stage Alzheimer's and art. There's a cross-cut saw upside down. There's a cross with a hat on it. And there's a high-top brogan. So in abstract, there is Lester's father. This was painted at a time when dad couldn't tell us what he was painting. In addition, you see a fence, a birdhouse, trees, leaves, and rocks. This was a metaphor for dad's life story. The blue collage speaks for who Lester was. This was dad's last painting, we think, which was of a saw with the handles worn off, I call it or the worn out saw. And this speaks metaphorically for dad as well. Still hanging in there with a steely tenacity after all those years. Well, we saw what art did for dad. And it's not only art, it's music, it's drama, it's imagination, it's reminiscence, it's dance and movement, it's poetry. All of the creative arts and we're learning more and more about what they do. They improve quality of life. They enhance perceived self-worth. They promote dignity, especially if they're, in, if they're incorporated with narrative or life story and reminiscence. They can improve someone's ability to communicate his or her story. They can stimulate memory, foster community, promote positive relationships, help address underlying behaviors, enhance temporarily cognitive abilities, and stabilize mood. And the end result is they enliven a sense of self-worth and they foster dignity. There have been many studies that have been done. I won't quote uh, much of that. We don't have time, but Eugene Cohen is a name that you run across uh, with much of his early work. Um, he did a 25-year study of people 65 years and older engaged in any kind of creativity, and the results were impressive, showing increased indices of physical health, decreased doctor visits, decreased medication usage, improved indices of depression, morale, and increased physical activity. He also found, and as has been found since that time, that creativity enforces the connections, reinforces the connections between neurons, brain cells, improves our resiliency emotionally and enhances well-being. And some recent studies, one that I've been drawn to is a study of 250 people in their 80s 
who were engaged in painting, drawing, and sculpting in midlife, and in later life, they had a much lower incidence of mild cognitive impairment. So it's preventative as well. You know, one wouldn't think that, that creating art could help someone with Alzheimer's because there's so many deficits that they have, but it really does. Art therapy, which understand dad was not what dad had. Dad had the use of the creative arts by an artist. And I'm not knocking that at all because I think any artist who is motivated and drawn to it has much to share. Um, expressive arts therapists like music therapists and art therapists have special training that they can bring to the table and, and really can do therapy and help people process through art. But art therapy relies on preserved abilities rather than attempting to correct disabilities. It provides a vehicle for emotional expression. It can engender a state of flow, which is um, this concept that is so good for our brains where we're so focused on something that time seems to stand still. It can promote social interaction, combat isolation, and it helps to overcome apathy and hopelessness and draws us into the present moment. The expressive arts therapies help people maintain awareness of their life stories and can aid in life story expression. And this is so important because the life story is who we are. So lastly, um, I want to go, I want to move into some lessons, some, some lessons we've learned from dad and others and I want to do this like I'm presenting basically a museum tour to you. So I'm going to use a piece of dad's artwork paired with a lesson. And we'll take out on that as we, we'll, we'll take the, the webinar out on that as we walk through um, this museum. Um, cognitive dynamics is our foundation and we try to use the expressive arts to improve quality of life. And also we use life story as well and storytelling. We have a program called Bringing Art to Life, which pairs people living with dementia with students, whether it be high school students in our program in Chicago, or whether it be college students at the University of Alabama or Birmingham Southern College. We pair up students with people living with dementia and we do art therapy. And we not only do art therapy, but we teach the kids about dementia, how to interact, some of the philosophies that we've talked about. And we let the kids get to know their new friends over a period of time. And then we use lifebio.com, who ACA has used as well, to create a leather-bound life storybook that contains art that persons have made and also life story that has come out that the kids have found out when they're spending time with their folks. This is some of the art that's been created through the program Art to Life. And some of what I'm gonna tell you in the last part of the webinar is lessons I've learned from those folks. So here we go. Here's the, here's the museum tour. Lessons learned from Lester and persons living with dementia and their care partners. That's a piece that was created in, in our program. The most important thing I can say is the innate value and dignity of human beings cannot be stolen by any condition or circumstance. And to care with compassion, we have to believe that all people retain an incontrovertible identity. That is dad's first painting, The Hummingbird. The beauty and vitality and relational energy inside the very person living with dementia can provide the inspiration for a care partner's journey. I never would have believed that until dad started bringing home the art. And it literally buoyed me and our whole family up. I should love and honor people in their current state rather than holding them accountable to be what my ego needs them to be. This goes back to the quote from Madeline Langley. We have to meet them in the now love them there. One of our participants in Art to Life said one time, please don't complete my sentences for me. We were trying to help him. He had some trouble with his language. 
and we were trying to help him through a story that he was telling. And he told us that, and it really caused us to think about this. I think often in the quest to help, we can derail somebody who's trying to express their thought. And so this is something that it helps me to remember as I interact with folks as well. Reverend Dr. Cynthia Hewling Hummel, who many of you have heard speak as well through ACA, said, I can't process two conversations at the same time. In one of our sessions, Cynthia was there and two students were talking to her, one on each side. And when the conversation to the right kicked off and the conversation to the left kicked in, we lost conversation. So it's important to remember that we have to process through a complete thought or conversation before we interject something else. And I have to, I have to retrain myself on that one. We should always look people in the eyes when they're sharing their stories, and we should realize they may be sharing their stories without using words. And this becomes increasingly important as someone experiences the later stages of dementia. And some of the most powerful interactions that I've had, and you can maybe be able to say the same thing, were people that couldn't talk to me. These were times of quiet sharing at a soul to soul level that has left me profoundly different. And so it took a state of inner quiet on my part that I'm always not ready to give, mind you, but if I let myself go there, we can have communication and it can be powerful being present with somebody. One story needs to come out. When words fail, we've already talked about art in all its forms, being a vehicle for expressing one story. The expressive arts and opportunities to explore creativity, I think, should be made available to everyone who's living with dementia. And this can be a challenging time to figure out how to do that. Nothing stirs the soul more than a feeling of belonging. And we got to do everything in our power to promote this kind of experience in people who are living with dementia, even if it has to be via FaceTime or Zoom or other technologies that we have in this pandemic. Always try to remember the silent struggles of others, which may lie buried beneath attitudes and behaviors that we don't understand. I think this concept illustrates as well as I can that dementia not only teaches us about dementia, but about life. I mean, when you walk this journey, it teaches you about life. And so a lot of the things that I'm sharing today are life lessons, not just lessons for those of us who interact with people living with dementia. And I want to be clear. These are not my lessons. I ain't that smart. These are lessons that I've thankfully been able to glean from people who've been through the fire and who are living it. We were doing art with Mr. Bobby one day and bringing art to life, and it happened to be a holiday, and you can see that it was Halloween. And our students asked Mr. Bobby, what's your favorite holiday, Mr. Bobby? And he said very simply and very profoundly, a day like today. What a motto. Every day for Mr. Bobby was a day to be celebrated. All of us know laughter is essential. It's the great equalizer. But I think that also listening rivals laughter is the best medicine. And listening requires that we use all our senses, not just hearing. Wonderful author and Canadian, Kathy Borey, author of The Long Hello, said, I learned to listen a different way to my mother when she got Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And Kathy wrote a book about that. And I encourage you to look at Kathy's book and get it. By the way, that painting that dad painted uh, there of a snowman on skis uh, had all of us intrigued because didn't snow much in Pickens County. 
and there was certainly no skiing snowmen. So maybe dad was imagining uh, of a, something he'd like to do there. We must not take ourselves too seriously. Play is important at any age. And as authors um, uh, like um, 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 Anne, I can't think of her name right now. I just bought her book. Um, who developed time slips, the program time slips. Um, the imagination is very important. Um, and we, we've got to be able to let people have play time because that's important for, for them and all of us. It's essential to develop the practice of self-compassion. Naomi File, the author of the Validation Breakthrough, says the hardest part for me in caring for my husband is to be independent in a dependent situation. And I thought that speaks of the, uh, of the irony of the experience of the caregiver. As a care partner, I should act as if my life is a mirror reflecting only the good and true image of personhood and none of the toxicity of dementia. Now, of course, we know that's not always gonna be the case. A very smart man, theologian, Dr. Jim Houston, told me caregiving brings out our worst or our best, and it may do so within a few minutes of each other. But I think a, a, a good goal is that we should mirror back the good and true image of a person in our interactions with them. There's no greater privilege, and I truly believe this, there's no greater privilege than to help somebody find his or her true voice and no crime, no greater crime than to silence it. Culture change, and that is changing the culture of dementia care cannot occur if the voices of those who are living with dementia are not heard. And I'm so thankful that many organizations, including ACA, are giving opportunities to people who are living with these conditions to speak from their experience it's very, very important that that happen. Don't take it personally if someone living with dementia offends you or hurts your feelings. And I've been guilty of that. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not the person speaking. It's uh, the effects of the dementia. I believe empathy is the game changer in creating a culture of compassion and dementia care. Empathy increases when people allow themselves to have meaningful relationships with those living with dementia. And I think it's especially important to facilitate this process in young people and start them as early as we can. That'll change things. Though the requirements of care partnerships can sometimes bring out our worst, they can also bring out our best human qualities. Um, I believe that this is a spiritual journey, as I've mentioned, and Drs. Morgan, or Dr. Richard Morgan and Dr. Gene Tibbalt have written about this in No Act of Love is Ever Wasted, a wonderful book, where they talk about cultiv cultivating spiritual intentionality, getting past denial and resentment to acceptance and gratitude, and choosing to look for opportunities to love more deeply in each moment of the ongoing care partnership. Another wonderful book. Reliance upon one's faith and spirituality can provide a deeper meaning to the journey through dementia for everyone involved. That, by the way, is the last painting that dad looked at when he was in hospice in West Alabama before he transitioned to his heavenly home. And it is now hanging in Hospice of West Alabama. Uh, Dad was a local artist. They, many, if, if you've been in that facility, they have the art of local artists. Well, Lester made the cut. So his art is, is hanging in that facility. Mindfulness is a very important practice to cultivate for people living with dementia, care partners, and healthcare providers. And there's a lot that's been written about mindfulness and present moment centeredness. Meaningful relationships can be maintained with people living with dementia, even in late stage. And presence, simply being present, is the most important characteristic of those relationships. 
Just a couple more. This one really cuts for me. The strength of the ego's need to remain, to retain control, often is proportional to the level of denial exhibited by a care partner. I had a need to maintain control of dad's situation as best as I could, and therefore I was denying a lot of what was going on at that time. So this has been a learning experience. Well, it's much better to be kind than right. When in doubt, default to kindness. When not in doubt, default to kindness. Um, so that, that I'm trying to practice more and more every day. The need for giving back never goes away. Generativity, allowing people to be generative and give back. And models of dementia care have to address this. Life's about relationships, and that doesn't change if somebody has dementia, as Lester and Albert show us. And lastly, showing others back to themselves may be the greatest gift we can give them. In closing, I want to share a poem with you that I wrote um, trying to speak in words that my dad would be telling me. And um, I started writing poetry because dad started painting. I had never written a poem in my life and seeing dad's arts made me creative. And so now I write songs, I write poetry, I stay up late at night, I got dark circles under my eyes, but I'm thankful that he gave me that mode of expression. This is Lester talking to me. Remember who you are, my child, who you were born to be. Let love be law and mind and heart, let life be charity. As bandaged begging hands assail your palisades of calm, let labor bring tranquility, let healing be its balm. When death itself so stealthily advances through your days, let quiet faith be your resolve, let living be your praise. Then when my spirit and my flesh unknit and I am gone, within your heart the finest part of me continues on. So I was not dad's primary caregiver. I was a secondary caregiver for dad. I acknowledged my mother as being his primary caregiver, as the one who walked with him day by day, and as the one who practiced much of what I've talked about today. Um, I honor caregivers, care partners. I honor professional and lay care partners. I honor everyone who's searching for a cure and effective treatments. I honor ACA, their whole board, everybody involved with their organization for the fine work that they do. And I'm thankful to have learned from people living with dementia and care partners so much that I can share with others today. So Miller, thank you. Katie, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be with y'all today. Thank <clears throat> hey, Danny, uh, Miller, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's a question in the chat. Can you see the chat? I can, but let me see if I can, I can read share. <clears throat> um, I don't see the chat. For so oh, I do see the chat. I do see the chat. It's a, about watercolor painting. Yeah, let's see. Um, watercolor painting is a skill many people, including me, do not prior to developing dementia, are there any new computer-based programs that would allow people with dementia to express their artistic inspiration while going through the process of dementia? Great question, and yes, there are. Um, I have to repeat that, because we, we lost a couple of words there, just so okay. I'm clear. Okay. Um, can y'all hear, yeah, I think when the, the yellow thing frames me, y'all can probably hear me when that's going on. But um, there, there are um, a lot of online activities for people. Um, there's, there's an app called the Mind app that was produced by GE Healthcare that should be available on uh, the App Store that has um, art, art activities as well as some, some educational activities. And there are, there are other apps that are in development out there and including museum apps, where uh, you can flip through with your loved one uh, some, some well-known paintings that are in the Louvre and the Metropolitan and other galleries. 
And a lot of people find that this is um, a, a nice activity as well. When you can't visit a museum, you can scroll through, but there, there are. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, Danny, I want to say that, you know, this is kind of the, I, I don't, I don't know if this is the right word, but the awkward moment of doing this on Zoom through a webinar, because you can't see or hear the standing ovation that your audience is giving you, because that was beautiful. I mean, I seriously have a tear in my eye. Thank you, Danny, for, you know, sharing Lester's beautiful, beautiful artwork. I think it, you know, you see one picture, it, 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 you have to see the whole catalog of what he was able to create. It is just, every one of them is just so priceless. And, and thank you for that and for putting your beautiful words and your wisdom to that. I, I know he would be so proud of what you have done and how you turned the negativity of an Alzheimer's experience into something so positive that has benefited so many. So thank you for what you do, Danny. I, I really want to thank you. And I'm sure some of y'all are watching and you're thinking, gosh, I wish my friend, I wish my mother, I wish someone else had, had watched this. And there is the beauty of the webinar because this program will be archived and will be available on ACA's website. So others will have the opportunity to, um, to see it. And I'm sure some of the people who are with us tonight may wanna see it again, just because um, you know, they may have missed a, a word or two and they wanna go back and, and, and refresh their memory. So thank you so much, Danny. My pleasure, thank y'all for having me. Katie, do you need to say another word about CEUs or you? I, I, what is supposed to happen is after this, a uh, you'll get a link to the survey. It's going to pop up somehow. I don't know where, but that's what Sherry told me. So we're just going to see. If for some reason you don't get the pop-up survey and you need a CEU, please email Miller, I mean uh, Sherry, at that email address, ACA2 at ALZCA.org. I'll write it in um, in the chat. But that is about it. The social workers will get a certificate and the nurses, I will submit your license numbers into the Board of Nursing website. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. I hope we'll see you on future uh, webinars. We're gonna um, try to have um, a couple of months at least and um, this will take the place of our annual conference and do visit ACA's website at alzca.org to learn more about what we're doing um, as far as um, continuing to, um, to provide services for families. But also we have got a really fun um, um, fundraiser and, and it is a, we're raising funds and fun um, celebrating um, our very own Vance Holder and his 60th mm -hmm. birthday. So. Y'all stay tuned for those um, exciting details. Thank you again, Danny, and thank you, Home Instead and, and Katie, and I appreciate <coughs> everybody being with us tonight. And one last thing, Danny, I'm gonna put the name to your book in the chat, just in case, because it's an awesome book, and I think everybody needs to check it out. It's The, the Pocket Guide to... Uh, it's um, A Pocket Guide for the Alzheimer's Caregiver. Okay. And it's available on it's available on on Amazon. It's available on Amazon, and I have an author page. If you go to Amazon and type my name, you'll see several of our books there, and uh, awesome. maybe some others too. So, everybody needs to check it out. It's great. Good. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye. Hey, goodbye.